Welcome to this month's webinar entitled Laboratory Data to Develop Industrial Supercritical CO2 Separation of Biological Substrates, Extraction of Lipids from Oil Seeds, presented by Dr. Jose Manuel del Valle from Pontificia Universidad Católica de Chile. Dr. Jose Manuel was born in 1959 in Santiago de Chile. He received his BS and Industrial and Chemical Engineering from Pontificia Universidad Católica de Chile in 1986. He, a Master uh, of Science uh, from the, in, um, a Master of Science in Food Science from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign in 1989, and a PhD in Food Science from University of Wealth, Ontario, Canada in 1992. He was hired by the Chemical Bioprocess Engineering Department of Pontificia Universidad Católica de Chile in 1992, where he currently holds a position as, a, as an associate professor. He started his research on supercritical fluids in 1999 and has developed considerable expertise on CO2 extraction of vegetables and other biological substances over the last 19 years. He, ca he has authored and co authored 66. 76, sorry, um, ISI publications and four book chapters. Before we start um, the, the presentation, let me remind you to, to mute your microphone and if you could to um, turn off your video during the presentation so that Dr. Jose Manuel get not, is not distracted by it. And afterwards, uh, you can turn it on during the portion of questions and answers. Um, if you have a question and you, during the middle of the presentation, uh, I ask you, I encourage you to write it down um, in the chat so that you don't forget. And you have two options, either at the end of the presentation, you can read that question to Dr. Jose Manuel, or I can read it for you. So without further, further delay, uh, welcome Dr. Jose Manuel Del Valle. Uh, thank you, very much, uh, Veronica. Uh, I'm here in uh, uh, Tecnológico de Monterrey as part of a sabbatical leave and uh, been here for about uh, uh, a month, suffering uh, the heat, but uh, they treat me really well. So I'll start with the, this presentation. This is going to be a fourth uh, part uh, presentation and uh, basically will show the extraction of lipids from oil seeds as an example of how you can uh, assess the economic viability of uh, supercritical CO2 extraction process for solid substrates. I will start uh, with acknowledgements just because I want to make sure that these people get recognized in case I run out of time. First of all, my colleague uh, Juan de la Fuente from uh, Universidad Técnica Federico Santa Maria. I've been working with him uh, since uh, 2000, and uh, he's an expert in uh, phase equilibrium. And then a couple of students that have been my uh, co-workers uh, or co-investigator in research projects. First of all, Professor Edgar Lukice from Universidad de la Frontera, uh, who obtained his PhD in 2005 working on microstructure extractability relationships. And then uh, Professor Gonzalo Nunez, uh, also from Universidad Técnica Federico Santa Maria, uh, who uh, finished his PhD in 2013, and who, uh, who work in uh, uh, process uh, simulation. That is basically the basis of this uh, presentation. Now, this is the map of the presentation. I won't show this anymore, uh, but I will mark transitions. First, uh, for uh, non-experts, uh, some uh, general uh, uh, background regarding supercritical CO2 extraction. Uh, then I will uh, uh, show uh, the mathematical model, modeling and uh, simulation of uh, supercritical CO2 extraction plants. And also I will uh, illustrate how you estimate the model parameters that are required uh, for process simulation. Next, 
I will show the uh, estimation of capital and operational cost uh, for an industrial supercritical CO2 extraction plant. And uh, at the very end, I will show some examples of the application of these uh, uh, simulation tools for the case of uh, the optimization on few uh, process parameters for, uh, for the extraction of all uh, from uh, seeds. So let's start with fundamentals. This is a pressure temperature diagram for a supercritical uh, for CO2. And uh, here I'm showing the uh, vaporization uh, line that ends in a so-called critical point that for the case of CO2 is 7.4 bar and uh, 31 degrees Celsius. So we are accustomed to transitions along this uh, 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 vapor uh, liquid line. For example, if I heat a liquid, uh, it will vaporize and then move uh, as a high temperature gas uh, in this gaseous uh, region. On the other uh, hand, if I uh, compress a gas, it will condense and then move in this liquid region. I want to state that in the gaseous uh, uh, region, there is little variation in density uh, with temperature. And on the other hand, in the liquid region, there is little variation in density with uh, pressure. If I do this same heating and pressurizing, but uh, uh, away from the uh, critical point, I will end up in a, a common region without uh, resorting to a phase uh, transition. So the supercritical uh, region is no more than uh, a, a region where the physical properties of a fluid are between those of a typical gas and those of a typical liquid. What uh, distinguishes the supercritical region is a very sharp change in uh, density and other physical properties with state conditions. So here I'm changing, uh, I'm showing uh, uh, temperature uh, changes required to increase density by uh, 200 uh, kilograms per cubic meter. Uh, the temperature change is small at near critical pressures, uh, about uh, 20 degrees Celsius at uh, 10 megapascal, but it's much larger uh, as the pressure increases to uh, 40 megapascal that is typically used in uh, extractions, where uh, that same 200 and kil uh, kilograms per cubic meter requires a change of about 60 degrees Celsius. So uh, this table shows how uh, uh, the physical properties of uh, fluids, uh, density, diffusivity, and viscosity change depending on uh, the state of the fluid. Uh, in the case of a supercritical fluid at the very end, uh, the density uh, uh, approaches that of typical liquids as pressure increases to a uh, uh, critical, uh, 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 reduced value of four. Uh, on the other hand, uh, diffusivity and viscosity decrease as the pressure decreases towards uh, typical uh, gas-like values. So what we have is a hybrid between liquid and gases that uh, uh, shares a uh, high density with liquids, which allows solvent power and excellent uh, transport properties such as low diffusivity and low viscosity uh, with the uh, gas state. Uh, I'm going to illustrate this uh, with a molecular simulation. Uh, uh, in here, we're showing uh, a screenshot of uh, CO2 molecules uh, in this supercritical state. Uh, and in here, I'm showing uh, 
a solute molecule uh, around which there is a cluster of uh, CO2 molecules that uh, solvate it. So uh, we have high local density that allows uh, uh, solvation, such as in the liquid uh, state, but these clusters are separated one from the other, uh, long distances such as in the gaseous phase, and this allows uh, excellent uh, transport properties. Let's see the effect of uh, changing uh, uh, state conditions on solubility of vegetable oil. And here I'm showing the actual solubility as a function of temperature for different uh, pressures. So the behavior is uh, uh, quite irregular in that the solubility decreases with temperature state uh, constant or increases uh, with pressure, uh, with temperature, uh, depending whether the pressure is low, intermediate, or very high. I'm going to stress that these changes in solubility are quite large because this is a log scale. Uh, how we explain these uh, results? Well, at high pressure, uh, what we have is a defect of temperature on uh, volatility uh, of the solute that increases uh, and uh, uh, determines an increase in solubility uh, with temperature. Uh, whereas at the low pressure, at low uh, pressures, near critical pressures, this increase in volatility is not enough to compensate a pronounced decrease in CO2 density uh, and uh, solvent uh, power. Uh, these changes, as I said before, are quite uh, pronounced, and I'm showing a decrease by a factor of 100 from 2% to 0.2% uh, in the solubility of oil uh, between typical extraction conditions of 60 degrees Celsius and 46 megapascals and typical separation conditions of 40 degrees Celsius and uh, 10 megapascals. And these changes in solubility, solubility will occur without a phase change. So this diagram is illustrated a typical uh, CO2 extraction plant. Details are, are, will, give, will be given later. There is a pump that increases pressures towards this 46 megapascal value. Uh, heat exchangers that adjust the temperature to require 60 degrees Celsius value and extraction along a pack bed extractor vessel. At the exit of the extraction vessel, I have to depressurize in a back pressure regulator and adjust the temperature so that in this separator, the oil that is extracted precipitates out and I have a stream of uh, gaseous CO2 at 40 degrees Celsius and 10 megapascal that requires to be condensated and uh, adjusted so that the solvent cycle uh, are continuous. So I'm, go I'm going to summarize what I've, uh, uh, I've shown up to here. Uh, I'll uh, show the uh, general properties of supercritical fluids that are variable physical properties with the small changes in pressure and temperature. Uh, and these uh, changes in physical properties are especially pronounced at near critical conditions. Uh, and it is possible uh, to change the solubility and uh, 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 precipitate out solutes without uh, resorting to uh, phase changes such as we saw uh, between liquid and gaseous state. Regarding uh, specifically to CO2, uh, there, uh, its particular properties are that is very selective towards high value uh, compounds uh, such as aromas uh, and pigments, uh, lipid-like uh, uh, compounds. It doesn't harm uh, uh, the extract or uh, uh, 
the extracted matrix, avoids the thermal damage, uh, and this is because uh, typically uh, we run uh, these processes at near uh, critical temperatures, which in the case of CO2 is 31 degrees Celsius. Uh, it's an expensive unless you need to pay for the CO2 to a gas company and it's convenient uh, in industrial processes. So let's go uh, to the first diagram again and show typical uh, extraction conditions such as uh, 50 degrees Celsius and nine megapascals for the extraction of uh, aroma compounds. Then uh, 30 megapascals and between 40 and 60 degrees Celsius to extract uh, lipids or triglycerides. And then much higher pressures about uh, uh, 50 megapascal in order to extract, extract uh, minor lipids such as carotenoids that are responsible, responsible for the coloration of uh, extracts. I can take all the compounds separately running uh, fractionation processes in which I start at near critical conditions and uh, remove first, first all uh, aroma compounds and then go up to higher pressures to extract lipids and finally to even higher pressures to extract pigments. This would be a, a batch process, but it can be run continuously, as I show here, uh, is basically the same diagram as before, but in this particular case, I'm having uh, different stages of uh, separation, where in the first stage, I precipitate out the less soluble compounds such as carotenoid pigments. In the second stage, I precipitate out uh, lipids, and in the last stage, I precipitate aromas. And I'm continuously decreasing uh, extraction, uh, the uh, CO2 pressure up to the time it is ready to uh, be recycled. I'm going to finish this section showing this, you this picture that basically, uh, 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 illustrate that this is not uh, 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 something that uh, stays in the lab, but it has uh, industrial applications. Here, there are several companies that are in uh, the business of selling uh, 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 industrial units. Uh, here, I sever there are several companies that are in the business of producing extracts uh, I will particularly highlight Flavix that has a really uh, wide variety of uh, products. Uh, in here, we have two companies that produce extracts from uh, algae. Uh, this group here, the Bart, uh, Bart has a, a, a group, produces extracts from hops that are used in uh, the production of beer and uh, so forth. Uh, there are companies in Europe, uh, in Asia, this is from Korea, Hawaii, uh, eh, and India. Let's go to the second part. Uh, what happened here? I'm not going to show you equations, but uh, here I'm describing how uh, extraction grinds. Uh, I have an extraction vessel has a diameter D and height L, uh, through which there is a stream of CO2 uh, uh, Q, and uh, there is a packed bed of a substrate, and the uh, solute is moving from the substrate to the moving CO2 stream. Focusing in uh, uh, the packed bed particles, uh, here we have a particle that has been pretreated. It has a particle, di particle diameter dp. I'm using the shrinking core uh, hypothesis uh, where there is a, a moving boundary 
that is shrinking uh, between the condensed oil and uh, uh, fluid within the uh, particle. It is important to state the solubility of the oil and CO2 at process conditions. Uh, the oil moves uh, through uh, the uh, outer uh, region of the particle uh, by diffusion that is characterized by uh, uh, effective diffusivity DE and from the surface of the particle to the CO2 by a film coefficient uh, Kf. Along the packed bed, there is actual dispersion phenomena that uh, helps disperse uh, solute uh, according to uh, concentration profiles. Let's see how we can estimate these uh, uh, parameters, solubility, effective diffusivity, film mass transfer coefficient, and actual dispersion coefficient. Starting with the actual dispersion coefficient, this is experimental data that, is, that has been obtained by several authors and basically shows a behavior where the actual dispersion coefficient relates to the effective diffusivity when the fluid is uh, not moving in this region. And then the actual dispersion is positively affected by fluid mo movement characterized by this Reynolds number. Also, the height uh, of the extractor to particle diameter affects uh, dispersion in the sense that it is much higher in industrial vessels, that is the upper line in here. Uh, regarding the uh, film mass transfer coefficient, uh, here I'm presenting data in a dimensionless plot of shared good number divided by Schmidt uh, to the one third as a function of Raymond uh, that I said before characterize a uh, flow regime within the extraction vessel. The lines represent uh, estimations of the film mass transfer coefficient uh, for packed beds operating with liquids and gases. And uh, the experimental data shows that uh, when operating with the uh, supercritical fluids, uh, we need to have particular correlations. The data is already there. And um, there are several equations that we can use to predict this uh, behavior. Regarding uh, the substrate, the pretreatment is paramount. Uh, here I'm showing a micrograph picture of a, a oil seed particle. I have a cell uh, where there are, there are spherosomes uh, containing oil uh, protein bodies that is surrounded by a cell wall that I need to disrupt prior to extraction. Uh, one way to do it is uh, applying shearing forces such as in flaking, and this uh, electronic micrograph showed the difference between the untreated seed and the flaked seed where uh, uh, cell walls are visibly disrupted. This is a diagram that shows that this pretreatment allows uh, the rupture of barriers to mass transfer from the, uh, the cells uh, to uh, the surface. And there appears uh, some uh, very fast uh, mechanisms such as washing that uh, operate. How do I uh, get these changes? Uh, here are two examples of high shear uh, disruption processes that are applied in order to uh, obtain these uh, purposes. First, pelletization. Uh, where I force the materials to uh, small openings in a die. Uh, and the second one is extrusion, where besides its high shear efforts, I apply temperature in order to uh, uh, get this purpose. These two uh, pretreatments also uh, allowed to increase the density of the substrate, which is paramount in uh, uh, increasing vessel load of the extraction vessel. 
uh, unlike uh, in the case of uh, fine milling, that also allows rupture of cell walls, but uh, uh, generates a really fine powder that has uh, problems such as low density and tendency to caking in the pack bed. Uh, here I'm showing that uh, I can get the effective diffusivity uh, as a function of a single so-called microstructural factor F that uh, is independent of extraction conditions. So here, a single material was treated at different extraction conditions, and all the curve curves are described by a single value. Uh, the effective diffusivity changes, but the changes are proportional to the binary diffusion coefficient that can be estimated. This uh, microstructural factor doesn't change is if I change particle diameter. This is a material that was pelletized and then was ruptured into particles of different size and uh, extraction curve at single conditions is described by a single microstructural uh, factor. The implication of this is that I need for a material, a particular material, a single experiment, and I will get uh, an estimate of this microstructural uh, uh, value that can be extrapolated to other extraction conditions uh, uh, that include changes in pressure, temperature, and particle uh, diameter. Other parameter that is important uh, to describe extraction is solubility of oil. And in this picture, I'm showing that regardless of the oil seed, uh, there is an equation that is the black one in here that uh, gives the solubility of uh, the oil with a plus minus 30% uh, error uh, as a function of uh, temperature. Here, all the values are presented uh, for 30 degrees Celsius and density, which uh, you may guess now is a, a factor determining uh, solubility to a great extent. So to, second, uh, to finish this second section, uh, my summary is that uh, based on the substrate properties, this uh, uh, treatment dependent microstructural factor part and particle diameter, the identification of a key component such as triolane in the case of the extraction of uh, vegetable oils, the specification of CO2 conditions, uh, uh, extraction temperature and pressure, uh, that uh, allow an estimation of uh, density and viscosity using uh, NIST database that gives the properties of CO2. The assumption here is that uh, there is no effect on these properties uh, uh, due to uh, a small amount of uh, uh, dissolved oil in CO2. Uh, the viscosity together with the identification of a key component allows an estimation of the binary diffusion coefficient, uh, in this particular case, using the equation of Unastukuri uh, and other authors. Finally, uh, I specify uh, the variables related uh, with the plant, the mass flow rate of CO2, the uh, volume of uh, the extractor, and the lens to diameter ratio of uh, the extractor. And with the volume and length to diameter ratio, I estimate the diameter and length of the vessel. And uh, the uh, CO2 density, the diameter of the vessel, and the mass flow rate allow an estimation of the superficial uh, velocity of the CO2. Next line gives some dimensionless parameters such as the length to particle diameter ratio, 
the Schmidt number that depends on the physical properties of the CO2 at extraction conditions, the Reynolds number uh, that depends on uh, the superficial velocity of the CO2, uh, particle size and physical properties of the CO2. Using uh, the equation of Del Valle and other authors, I can estimate the ratio of the L to the 1, 2. And using Reynolds and Schmidt number, uh, I can estimate a uh, Sherwood number using a, correl uh, rela a correlation such as the one of King and Cashpol from nine, 1993. Uh, the temperature and the density of the CO2 allow estimation of the solubility of vegetable oil and CO2. The microstructural factor and the binary diffusion coefficient allow an estimation of the, of the effective diffusivity. Uh, I can finally estimate uh, the actual uh, uh, dispersion coefficient and the film mass transfer coefficient. Uh, next. I'm going to go to the cost uh, uh, section. And basically, uh, uh, we start with the capital cost. And we say uh, the capital cost of an industrial plant is defined by the solvent cycle. That is everything outside the light blue section. And uh, the extractors. And I want to point out this, that this three uh, extraction vessel plant has three units that are identical when it comes to uh, components. So basically, the solvent cycle that is defined by the mass flow rate of CO2 and the uh, volume and number of the extraction vessels are the things that I need to estimate the cost. So this diagram here is trying to show that uh, regardless of the size of the unit, from very small in this region to very large in this region, allows an estimation of a so-called price index uh, uh, as a function of the mass flow rate of CO2 and number and volume uh, of the extraction vessels. This factor in here, 0.48, is a a scaling factor that is slightly different from the uh, 0.6 factor that is commonly used in uh, 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 cost estimations. Uh, this alpha and beta uh, uh, basically give the uh, ratio of the cost between the solvent cycle uh, in this part and uh, the extractors. And uh, basically, I'm using as a reference a two-vessel plant with one cubic meter extraction vessels uh, and solvent cycle of uh, six ton per hour of uh, CO2. So basically, with our correlation, the only thing that I need to establish is the uh, value of a reference plant that may change with uh, time. Uh, so this will give me an uh, I factor, but actually I need to add other components such as the uh, uh, building, uh, other components such as uh, insulation, electricals, etc. And this factor in here uh, allows to change from uh, uh, investment at the very beginning to a uh, yearly cost uh, as a function of uh, discount rate and the length of the life of the plant. Labor uh, can be estimated uh, for a continuously operating uh, plant as a function of the uh, number and the cost of the employees. And here we are assuming that uh, uh, three shift uh, plant will require uh, four of these uh, uh, units in order to operate yearly. Uh, now let's go to uh, the operational cost associated with the plant itself. And the first 
uh, thing that I will need is energy in order to move uh, the CO2 around the system uh, and also uh, to heat it up and to uh, cool it down as required by the process. So in here, one represents uh, conditions at the extraction vessel, two represents uh, conditions of CO2 after separation, three represents conditions of CO2 in the uh, uh, vessel buffer, uh, basal buffer, four indicates condition of CO2 after pre-cooling in order to uh, 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 avoid cavitation in the pump, and five indicates the conditions at the exit of the pump, and I will need to heat or cool uh, in order to adjust the conditions to the required value. I can show the energy demand in a temperature entropy diagram. And uh, here are the extraction conditions. This is what uh, occurs when I do uh, expansion and heating. Here I have CO2 in gaseous state and uh, uh, buffer vessel temperature of 25 degrees Celsius. I need to condensate to place it as liquid. This is pre-cooling, this is compressing, and this is the uh, cooling that I will require in order to get to the required extraction conditions of 30 megapascal and 40 degrees Celsius. The table uh, gives uh, the amount of heating, cooling, and compressing, and the cost of these items. So this will be the uh, cost of the solvent cycle, per unit mass of CO2. Uh, so if I want to uh, uh, express this as an annual cost, I will have to multiply by the mass flow rate of CO2 through the plant, uh, uh, plant in tons per hour and the number of hours that the plant is going to be working in the year. Other things that I need to account for is the cost of the substrate. This is the bulk uh, density of the substrate, and this is the cost of the substrate. So uh, I will have to multiply by the volume of the, ext uh, uh, the extraction vessel and the number of batches that are, I will run every year in order to get the final cost of the substrate. Uh, I will lo lost some CO2. One, when venting the extraction vessel, this is the density of the uh, CO2 after uh, recovering uh, most of the CO2 to the buffer vessel. And this is the amount of uh, CO2 that is dissolved in the extracted uh, oil. Uh, this is the mass fraction of uh, CO2 in the extract, and uh, this is the yield of extraction. Uh, I will also need uh, energy to uh, get CO2 to the, to the extraction conditions uh, during the compression stage, being this the uh, initial porosity of the pack bed, uh, and uh, during the decompression stage, being this the uh, porosity of the pack bed in the final conditions. So this is my final expression for the cost, where this CB, have components associated with the substrate, with the energy required to compress and decompress the extraction vessel, and with the CO2 that is vented from the extraction vessel. And this part in here represents the uh, uh, component of the cost that is associated with the release of CO2 from the extract. I want to stress that when I have a multi-vessel uh, plant, uh, the extraction curve is a little different from the ones I showed before, uh, because in a way I have a variable uh, uh, inlet conditions. So in this particular example, uh, CO2 from the solvent cycle is not shown complete, it goes into uh, this vessel that is uh, has a, a particle, a, a partially extracted substrate, and then 
to a second vessel uh, where I put a fresh uh, uh, substrate and then uh, to the solvent cycle. And this one in here is being a reconditioning, uh, being depressurized, emptied, uh, reloaded, and pressurized in the time uh, being. Uh, after this uh, vessel is exhausted, I switch conditions, and the second one is now my first one. Uh, the one that was being reconditioned is the second, and the uh, 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 last one is uh, reconditioning, and then to a last stage, uh, where three is the first, one is the second, and the second is being reconditioned. So uh, the simulation program will allow to uh, uh, describe the extraction curves under uh, these conditions. So uh, this diagram is showing the scheduling for a three vessel plant. Uh, I, I had my three extractors uh, in here and blue indicates being uh, under the process and white uh, indicating being reconditioned. So to estimate the number of batches in a year, I will need to establish the length of the time that I will be uh, operating in the year. And this term in here is indicated that uh, only in the first period I, I won't uh, have a, a vessel entering the process. Uh, and uh, clearly the switching time uh, which, which, that were shown before is related with the total extraction time and the number of extraction vessels in the plant. So uh, in a, a three vessel plant, the switch uh, time is one half of the extraction uh, time. And in a four uh, plant, uh, the switch time is one third of the extraction uh, time. So to end this section, uh, I'll uh, uh, show the uh, total production cost as a number of the factor as a function of the factors shown and uh, before this production cost is given by the total cost divided by the amount of oil that i'm recovering in the plant this third term is the capital cost this uh, second uh, uh, term is associated with the operational cost this uh, five percent factor is associated with contingencies uh, uh, I have to include labor, the cost of the CO2 cycle, uh, the uh, cost associated with the substrate, uh, CO2 compression and decompression, and vented uh, CO2, and finally uh, the cost associated with vented CO2 with the extract. Uh, this equation is showing me that uh, it, it is the yield as a function of extraction time and number of extraction vessels and the number of uh, uh, batches that I will produce in the year that will deter determine the final cost. And this is the total yield of the system. So let's go to the final uh, 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 section of my presentation. Uh, I will go uh, re relatively fast uh, to show my examples. So what happened when I change extraction time? Basically, I improve extraction yield, which is the red line, but at the cost of producing less oil in my plant in the year. So based on this, uh, there's going to be an intermediate extraction time where the substrate is not uh, totally exhausted, but the productivity is sufficiently uh, high in order to have a maximum. And here, I'm showing this uh, as uh, uh, the extraction uh, cost 
as a function of extraction time. Uh, I put the, the figure in this way in order to uh, uh, give more details about the uh, distribution of the cost. Obviously, uh, the optimal is between two and three hours based on this picture. If the time is uh, too little, uh, uh, I don't have, uh, I don't take a, a good enough advantage of the substrate and the CO2. And those are the ones that are driving the cost up. On this region, on the other hand, when I uh, uh, take almost all the oil from the substrate so as to decrease uh, the contribution of the substrate to the total cost, I'm um, uh, 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 not taking full advantage of the large investment I did in the plant. So my examples now, first uh, for a two vessel plant, I'm showing the effect of a particle size on uh, 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 the cost of extraction. And basically I'm seeing here that I require to reduce particle diameter uh, in order to reduce extraction cost. Uh, the extraction time is being extended which is weird because uh, uh, smaller particles uh, should be extracted uh, faster. The other thing that is very clear from the picture is that this reducing in particle diameter has really marginal uh, effect when the particle diameter is sufficiently small. And it appears as if I don't need to go uh, farther beyond the 0.5 uh, to two millimeters in order to get a very uh, good uh, pros process from the cost standpoint. Next, I'm showing the effect of uh, the mass flow rate of CO2 that affects the superficial velocity of the CO2 in the extraction vessel. And here, it is clear that I can reduce uh, cost increasing uh, uh, superficial velocity and uh, decreasing uh, particle diameter, but the effects uh, are not very large uh, in this region here. Uh, so uh, uh, in between five and 10 millimeters per second, probably I have a good enough uh, a superficial CO2 velocity. It's important to state that according to Eggers, uh, this um, uh, mass flow uh, superficial velocity should be between one and five. So uh, we are uh, suggesting that uh, uh, higher velocities can be used in this uh, particular case. Final effects is related with the number of extraction vessels. And uh, I have a continuous uh, curve for the two extractors basically because have a, a continuous function to describe yield. When it comes to three or four extractors, I need to specify uh, first uh, the extraction time, time in order to do the simulation of uh, the plant. But our algorithm allowed us to approach uh, the minimal uh, uh, and focus uh, into it so clearly. When I increase the number of extraction vessels, I reduce the cost, at, uh, but I require to do a longer extraction time. How do we explain this? Well, basically because uh, uh, using CO2 coming from extraction vessels where he pick us, it picks up uh, oil from the substrate, uh, reduces the amount of uh, oil that, that can uh, take from the matrix, uh, and this is the reason why four extraction vessels, the extraction curve for four extraction vessels is a little slower. Uh, when it, uh, I look at the advantages though, uh, the amount of CO2 that is coming from the last extractor and that goes into the separators has a larger amount of uh, dissolved oil, uh, because of this simulated counter current uh, contacting. 
So coming to an end, uh, some perspective, I shows uh, that mathematical simulation can aid in the design and economical analysis of an industrial uh, CO2 extraction plant. This was illustrated uh, for the extraction of uh, vegetable oils. Uh, we can extrapolate uh, this to other applications. What will we require to uh, do? Well, uh, to determine uh, those physical properties that are particular for this substrate. These are solubility and the description of the inner mass transfer in the solid substrate uh, that is uh, dependent on the treatment that should be optimized. Uh, clearly, uh, we uh, have to uh, uh, demonstrate that uh, our uh, simulation results are appropriate doing uh, some experiments uh, at larger scales. Uh, so uh, with that, I think I'm done and ready for the questions. I will leave you uh, my contact information in case your question uh, doesn't get answered at uh, this time. Thank you, Veronica. You can take it from here. Thanks, Dr. Del Valle, for sharing your knowledge with us. Uh, let's start the question and answer portion of the webinar. Remember to turn on your microphone and your video, uh, if you want the video, the video is optional, <laughs> um, to ask the question directly to Dr. Del Valle. If not, you can write it down in the chat and I can read it out loud for you. Do we have any questions? Well, um, while somebody um, asks you a question, I, I have, um, you didn't say this in, in, in your talk, but I, I'm, this would be an alternative for a conventional extraction process, right? Mm -hmm. So comparing the costs between the two of them, I know this will be a more, um, greener option, environmentally uh, right. better option. Okay. But in comparison with the costs, uh, do you have an estimate of okay. I, the I difference? Have, I have actual values in my pictures. I got down to about uh, uh, 12 uh, 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 US dollars per kilogram of oil. That depends on the yield. Uh, we assume pre-press uh, seeds that had about 20% uh, residual oil in them. Uh, my understanding is that value is not uh, 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 compatible with uh, other technologies when it comes to uh, commodity oils. Uh, but that's not the case for uh, specialty oils that have application in cosmetic and others. And uh, the other argument I can use is that there are uh, uh, some companies such as Flavic that produce uh, uh, vegetable oil using supercritical CO2. They don't have uh, 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 corn or uh, uh, soy, uh, but they have things like uh, uh, Rosa Mosqueta, oh, I forget the name. Uh, uh, olives, uh, uh, things like that. Okay. Uh, it's uh, uh, a little more expensive, but it's, it is justified for uh, some uh, uh, applications. Okay, um, any more questions? Uh, I should expand uh, though. Uh, all my examples were for extraction at uh, uh, 40 degrees Celsius and 30 megapascal. Uh, the last study with the Gonzalo uh, Nunez, we went up to 50 and 70 megapascal, and then we got uh, uh, the possibility of reducing cost uh, 
using higher pressures. We have a question from Esteban Guardiola. Um, have, have you tried other gases with better, um, or if you try different gases, they will have better efficiency? Like instead of using CO2, I guess? Actually, uh, it's only a um, uh, few uh, researchers that have tried uh, something different. Uh, they've tried uh, propane, butane, things like that. And uh, solubilities are a bit higher, but uh, there is a problem that the plant needs to be uh, built against uh, uh, be uh, explosion and fireproof. So uh, that makes uh, those plants uh, a little uh, uh, harder to, 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 to design. And uh, basically people uh, uh, discover CO2 and apply it. The only thing that uh, they do is uh, use some co-solvents uh, to extract uh, low solubility substances such as phenols and others. Uh, rather than changing the uh, solvent, the, te the technology is uh, evolving in order to uh, uh, get faster extraction rates using higher pressures, about 100 uh, megapascal. That's the technological limit at present. Okay. Um, we have another question from Karina Parra. Uh, she is um, asking if you are looking for a company that could be an option to implement your research. Like she knows you're doing research on this, but if you're looking for a company uh, okay. that would implement it. Uh, actually, part of the sabbatical in here is maybe uh, looking for Mexican companies more uh, willing to do this uh, uh, locally. Uh, the only experience I have in Chile was a company that produces uh, Hematococcus pluvialis and was my partner in a Fondef project. Uh, this company at the time was uh, using the services of other companies in order to get the extract and uh, basically wanted to learn uh, how the technology worked, but uh, he never... Uh, got uh, the feeling that he should have his own uh, plant uh, and uh, did the work with others. Uh, we're still waiting for a plant in Latin America to get started. Uh, it's uh, a matter of getting uh, a company that is uh, willing to make the investment and probably those companies need uh, an example next to them that the thing is actually operating. Uh, I wish uh, I'll see this in my time because uh, in Asia, this thing has been implemented. I'm not talking about Japan and Korea, but I'm also talking about India and uh, uh, China. Okay, um, so thank you. Some of the listeners want to uh, to uh, have an idea or, or want to hire me in order to do this in uh, commercially. I'll be more happy, more than happy to help. I think I think that would answer answer Karina Barra's uh, uh, question. Anyways, she can. I guess she can contact you with the email that it's on the right on the presentation if she has right. more questions regarding right. that. Uh, we have another question from Andres, um, and he asks, is there, is, is there a ratio, ratio between the length and diameter recommended for extraction vessels right. in a laboratory scale oh. versus um, um, industrial scale? Or Okay, uh, according to Agus, uh, you should... Uh, uh, Sorry, uh, I, I didn't get that. Uh, according to Eggers, you should use between uh, four and six. Uh, one of the studies uh, 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 focus uh, on to that. Uh, basically, uh, when you increase uh, the, 
diameter of the vessel. Teacher, I have an earthquake uh, alarm, so I'm going out. Bye. I, I didn't get that. Uh, so to increase the uh, vessel diameter, uh, you need, need to increase the mass flow rate of CO2 and uh, the cost of the uh, uh, solvent cycle in order to get a particular uh, superficial velocity. But uh, 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 for the same uh, volume, uh, the extractor uh, is uh, shorter and uh, you don't get to exhaustion uh, of the substrate. Uh, you don't uh, get a situation where the CO2 is saturated with uh, oil along the extractor so that the later portion of the extraction vessel is under operation. So that's the balance you need to, to do. Uh, uh, higher lens to diameter allows you to run a uh, 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 cheaper solvent cycle, uh, but uh, you are not using the uh, CO2 as, efficiency, as efficiently as it gets saturated with uh, oil some way along the line. So I would say one to uh, four to, to six. Um, I, um, thank you. I have to explain a little bit. You had two interruptions. I think one of the people here had to leave because of an earthquake. Oh. That's earthquake uh, alarm. Uh, I don't know. That's why, that's what you heard. Okay. Um, we Hopefully it's not a true earthquake and it's not in Chile. <laughs> Hopefully. Um, we have another question from Adolfo Cabrera. And I will ask Adolfo if he can elaborate a little bit more um, on his question because I, it's not very clear. Uh, he says something about how change all the approaches. How, how do you change all the approaches when you're interested in polar compounds? Uh. Hi Adolfo, uh, nice to, to have you here. Uh, when you have uh, polar compounds, you need to add uh, polar co-solvents such as a CO2, so, uh, such as ethanol, for example. So uh, you need to uh, estimate the physical properties of mixtures of CO2 and ethanol. It's a bit more complex. You don't have NIST to do that. But there is a lot of uh, studies on, uh, on that. Uh, other than that, uh, uh, there is no uh, uh, other difficulties at the laboratory scale. At the industrial scale, however, uh, my guess is that uh, reconditioning of CO2, it's going to be a little more uh, complex because you will need to measure and adjust uh, the amount of ethanol in the, in the stream. Uh, so uh, I know it is done commercially, but my guess is that uh, the solvent cycle is going to be much more complicated than shown in here. Uh, if I wasn't clear enough, please send me an email. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not hearing you. Uh... Sorry, sorry. Um, we have another question from Carlos Ceballo from Campus Monterrey. Uh, have you explored the combination of supercritical fluid techniques with other technologies in order to increase the yield and decrease extraction time? Uh, not personally, but there are things such as uh, uh, using... Uh, oh, sorry. Uh, uh, ultrasound uh, uh, in the vessel in order to uh, improve uh, inner mass transfer within uh, the substrate. Uh, my guess is that anything that will uh, help uh, release the solutes uh, from the substrate but not at the cost of reducing 
particle diameter to a very large extent uh, is, uh, 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 is something that you should, uh, you should try. Uh, when it comes to uh, combinations, uh, but uh, uh, yeah, that's what I think. Uh, we have another question from Ulises Salas. Um, can you tell me if the dimension equation for bubble column reactor bioreactor can be used for the design of the vessels for this type of process? Wow. <laughs> uh, you kill me with that question. Uh, I don't know anything about bubble uh, reactors. Is that a pressure vessel? Uh, if it is a pressure vessel, uh, my guess is that uh, uh, it's a very standard thing to uh, determine the thickness of the wall of the vessel uh, as a function of the inner pressure and the vessel diameter. Uh, but uh, we'll, we'll have to ask another expert. Uh, sorry. Now, Isabella uh, asks, um, if you follow an already established entropy cycle to generate one um, on the column, oh, wait, sorry. She wants to know if you follow an already established entropy cycle to generate one on the equilibrium of CO2 in the process. And if this can be applied to other materials that are, that are in gases. Uh, the, uh, the diagram I use uh, for the development of the solvent cycle uh, assumes that the uh, amount of dissolved oil in uh, CO2 is small enough not to uh, uh, change the physical properties of CO2. My guess is that it could be applied in any case where the solubility of the substance substances is small enough. Uh, in the case of very soluble uh, substances, such as essential oils, uh, uh, ethanol, or other organic solvents, uh, my guess is that you will uh, need to develop that uh, such diagram. I'm not certain if I'm uh, replying to the actual uh, question of uh, Isabella, uh, but uh, if it's not the case, uh, please uh, send me an email and elaborate. Uh, any more questions from the audience? That's a lot of questions from the audience. <laughs> we still have a few minutes. Um, if not, if there are no more questions, oh, well, um, Adolfo Cabrera and Ulises both, thank you for your okay. answer. Thank you. Okay, if there are no more questions, uh, let's, I will finish the webinar here. So thank you again, Dr. Del Valle. Uh, thank to you. And, uh, uh, good luck, professor. Oh, there's someone here. Um, oh. No, it's only for thanking the professor. It was an excellent presentation, and I already emailed you uh, okay. some information I would like to um, elaborate more with you, but via email. Okay. Uh, Victor, right? Yeah, Victor Martinez. Okay. Okay, I'll, I'll wait for your email. Thanks, professor. Bye-bye. Well, thank you again, Dr. Del Valle, for this interesting talk, and thank you all for participating in this webinar. Keep tuned and check out our website or fa Facebook page for, or for more information uh, about our webinar next month. Okay. Thank you a lot, Pedro. Thank you all. Uh, can I exit now? <laughs>